safer by doing the right thing. You've been the designated driver, you've stayed over, called home, you've called a cab or a friend, and planned ahead. Let's keep doing the right thing. Support sober driving by getting yourself and your friends home safely. Do the right thing. Visit arrivealive.org to find out more. Arrive Alive. Drive sober. These days at your local Legion, we're marching to the beat of a different drum on a mission to support veterans, to have fun, and to welcome everyone to our ranks. You don't have to be a veteran to join the Legion. And as a member, you'll join thousands of others serving our veterans, our communities, and our country. Oh yeah, and our member perks program will save you thousands on shopping, dining, products, and services across the country. Join us at legion.ca. Everybody. My name is Jason Piercy, and this is Out of the Fog. On this episode, we're going to talk nitty-gritty, some serious problems that our local communities have. We're going to talk about things we're doing to fix them, maybe things that we need to do better, and we might even get controversial enough to point a finger or two. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to Out of the Fog. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to a man I've known a very long time, but I'm not entirely sure it's, I can really call it an introduction. Uh, Mr. Dan Meads, hello, you've been here a couple times before. It's nice to see you as always. It is nice to see you as always. Um, and this particular time, this particular visit, uh, we're speaking to you as the provincial coordinator of the Transition House Association of Newfoundland and Labrador. That's and right. I'm glad that that's the name because I can just say Thanel yeah. for the rest of this. Yeah, it's fine. And it's better than if you had like something really difficult. Yeah. Nope, that's it. So I work with 11 shelters for women and children fleeing violence throughout Newfoundland and Labrador. I help make sure those shelters are, are working together well and help government make better decisions for the people that they serve. Interesting way to word that. Help the government make better decisions for the people that they serve. Yeah. And uh, the way that you identify the 11 types of shelters, is it appropriate to list maybe a name or two, just so that the audience has yeah, the context absolutely. for exactly what we're talking about. Yeah, sure. Here in St. John's, we're talking about Iris Kirby House, most notably. So that's our biggest shelter in Newfoundland and Labrador. But you know, we've got 10 others all the way up the coast to Labrador. And so Willow House in Cornerbrook or Kara House in Gander, um, the Nain Transition House in Nain. You know, th these are places that provide their communities and the communities surrounding that, right, so their geographical regions, a safe place for women and children who are experiencing violence, whether that's physical violence or economic violence, um, to find a place to be while they regroup and get back on their feet and see what's next. This is the first time I've ever heard the term economic violence. Yeah, sure. So, be, uh, so I feel there's a lot of stuff that we can get into, and the crux of it really is that I kind of want to talk about a serious housing crisis mm -hmm. that we have here locally and I think without putting words in your mouth or defining something I just heard for the first time in my life yep. I feel like economic violence may lean into some of the cause effect issue we have there yeah sure so let's talk about so, so there's two there's two pieces to talk about here right one is women and children fleeing violence and what happens there so we know roughly 60 percent of people living in poverty in newfoundland and labrador are women we know we have the highest child poverty rate in all of canada at about 9.8 percent as we sit here today having this conversation okay so so 9.8 percent of children are impoverished right. or 9.8% yeah. of impoverished people are children? No, you got it right. Kay. So yeah, that's right. So almost 10% of kids in Newfoundland and Labrador 
are living in poverty today as we sit here. Now, the government established that or identified that as one area that they're looking to make considerable change and in the poverty reduction strategy or the plan that was announced just a couple of weeks ago. That's one of the areas that they say they're going to focus. Some details are left out of that and I look forward to hearing the details because they've got some big ambitious goals there. Okay. That's the first set. The second set to talk about though is this bigger housing crisis that's been really quite notable and newsworthy for about the last six or seven weeks here in St. John's. For the first time in my lifetime we've got the public being aware of homeless tent encampments on government land. Now those encampments aren't new they've just been in the woods sort of just outside the city or within sure. city limits but right now you know for the last while they've been either at Colonial Building down near Bannerman Park or, or up on Confederation Hill uh, and it's really sparked some significant conversation about what the housing crisis means in Newfoundland Labrador. Now those tent encampments are here in St. John's but I have to tell you they're also in Goose Bay they're also in sure. Labrador City. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's not the first time that we've seen this, it's just the first time that, that the general population is paying really close attention. So if we have these encampments, as you call them, and they're a, they're, they are evidence of, but also a symptom of a housing crisis, yeah. how can we define the problem itself? Because obviously it's a problem that people have to sleep in tents on government property. Yeah. Clearly that's an issue, nobody's fighting that, but it's not the problem is not that they have tents on these places. Yep. The problem is that housing within their means is inaccessible. Right. And the reason that's the case is because government doesn't agree with you that a tent encampment is a problem. That's why the Minister Ooh, of okay, Children... Okay, no, no, okay, hold, hold on. on now. Here, no. now hear me out. The Minister of Children, Seniors and Social Development, Paul Pike, was in front of cameras 21 days ago as we sit here and chat and said he was doing, quote, a stellar job. That's why people were living in tents outside his office. And so, no, we can't say, hey, it's a problem that people are living in tents when the minister in charge of the file says he's doing, quote, a stellar job, when he says Premier Fury is doing, quote, a stellar job. So he thinks it's acceptable. You know how I know? Because he hasn't fixed it. <laughs> yeah. Andrew Fury thinks the same thing. You know how I know? The same reason. He hasn't fixed it. And so we have the Newfoundland Labrador Housing Corporation, the largest landlord in Newfoundland and Labrador, and they haven't been able to find units. They've got a waiting list of over a year long. That's not just for those individuals that we're seeing in tent encampments around the city. That's, That's a for people list. who have already applied. That's correct. Yeah. Now, it's remarkable to me that in the two weeks that they were living across from the Confederation Building, that 12 individuals from that encampment suddenly found us units with the Newfoundland Labrador Housing Corporation. What, they a, what a wonderful coincidence. They just happened to be the next 12 on the list. Gosh, that seems a bit odd to me. But, but when we say these things, like you and I have this conversation and people at their dining room tables have this conversation, they say, gosh, it is a universal truth that it is bad that people are living in tents on Confederation Building and in, at Colonial Building. Our government does not agree because they have not solved the problem. I'm not going to object to the summary because I think that it, it does make 100% sense. However, I'm going to use an analogy. If you don't identify a problem correctly, it, it, it doesn't mean that you agree that the status quo is okay. So is it possible, and I'm not defending the provincial government, I'm, this is about conversation because I want to be like, how do we fix it? Kind yeah, of. Sure. Is it possible that, that what is being said is them being intense ain't the problem. Right. The problem is we don't have somewhere else to put them. Right. Is that the transition? Sure. Or is it like, no, I'm amazing. You voted me in. I want another vote in so I can retire and have a pension for the rest of my life. Right. There's two sets of problems here. So if, we th if we think about how do we stop people from having to sleep in tents, right? And so it's the sleeping in tents isn't the problem. It's the fact that they have to. That's the concern. There's two ways about that. Number one, you make the thing they need, which is housing, cheaper, right? You can do that through subsidy, you can do it through lots of ways, or you give them enough money to afford housing as it is. Those are our two options. There's no other way. So do we have information, or do you, because yeah. I, I have some just from being running a real estate business, yep. there's certain things that I have access to that perhaps other people wouldn't, so I'm aware of our vacancy rates and I'm yeah, aware sure. of all these different things. Um, the people, do we know what the economic status of the average person who is in these encampments yeah. is. Yeah. So like, say 24 months ago, the average rent in and around the city of St. John's was significantly lower. 
could they afford average month, average rent then? Some could and some couldn't. Okay. So let's, there's, there's two sets of people, right? And so now we're speaking pretty broad generalizations. Jason, and, 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 and so it's, almost it's okay, because I, I, it's illustrative, yeah. but it is an absolute. And so let's keep that in mind. As sure. Well. In the tent encampments and everywhere you go in the city of St. John's, right? Like, like all you need to do is walk up Water Street and you're going to see folks that are struggling, whether yes. they're living in a tent or not. Those individuals are most likely on income support, what we used to call welfare when we were growing yes. up. Income support payments right now for most of those individuals are about 42% of the poverty line. So if all of those payments were doubled today, those individuals would, would still, still be in not be able to afford. A so what's the poverty today? line in and around St. John's? Probably 2,000-ish a month? Yeah, a little more than that, but that'll get you there. Yeah, 24 grand a year will get you pretty close. So it depends on how you want to measure it, et cetera. 28 grand is like a pretty good spot. And now, the federal government says that you can't spend more than like 33% of your gross income a month on housing. That's right, otherwise you're considered housing insecure. That's right. Well, well I'm, okay, so this, this math yeah. has a negative amortization, like this, this yeah. never works. That's right. So, government has some options there, right? One of them is to build a ton of social housing units the way they did in the 70s, thus taking that wait list from a year down to ideally, not a year, ideally a week, ideally a day. If you call and say, hey, I am homeless tonight, I need a place to stay, in the housing first model, which the government of Newfoundland yes. Labrador used to talk about, they don't talk about it anymore, they used to talk about it back when they promised a, a homelessness eradication strategy. They would say, no problem, let's get you in a place to live and then we're gonna provide some wraparound supports about whatever caused you to be in this circumstance, right? Having this conversation in the absence of talking about addictions and mental illness is sure. pretty short-sighted. And we, know, we all know that, right? Yeah. So that's the first way we can do it. Build some social housing, get some people in those houses. Interesting choices. The other way to do it is to say, hey, the cost of rent has gone up. We don't have enough social housing units but there is a vacancy rate still in St. John's and surrounding areas. Maybe if we just paid people enough to be closer, 80% of the poverty line by some stats will get you there and not disincentivize people going back to work in whatever way they can. Allow people to still make some really tough choices, but one of the choices they can make is to pay rent and have a roof over their heads. Fair and sensible. I have two thoughts. One is related to um, the recent flurry of people wanting to be in the short-term accommodation business. Yeah, right. And that has removed a great deal of stuff mm -hmm. from the market. And everybody yeah. says, well, landlords are the problem. And, blah. Yeah, sure. I, and there's a whole, that's a whole thing. Yeah. So the government stepping in and trying to make that a little bit harder to do mm -hmm. from registering and taxation and yeah. stuff, I think that will provide a little bit of relief, but yep. it'll take a while. Yep. The other one that comes to my mind is that you can say to anybody who is from in and around St. John's to name a couple of communities that they don't consider to be the nicest yeah, communities. Sure. And they'll name the places that that were built in the 70s for yeah. this purpose. Absolutely. So are we then propagating the same thing again? Yeah, it depends on how we do it. But also, those individuals include, like, these are people we know, right? And so there's this notion that these are, like, somebody else in the city. But listen, man, we grew up here. Sure. These are our cousins in lots of cases. Like, this, these are people that we know and that we love. Those individuals would rather live in a Newfoundland Labrador housing block that doesn't have the best reputation than in a tent next sure. to Animate Park. Yeah, and as I a wasn't community, thinking about the people. I was thinking about the rest of us right. and how we need to be better at right. so that. One like, of the joys of living in Center City or downtown St. John's is that the house across the street from you can cost a million dollars and the house next door to you can cost 200000 It's a really mixed place sure. to live. It's wonderful. It's part of the reason I like this, part of the reason I moved back home. It does create some concerns in that regard. But I will say this. If we're talking... We can have a conversation about where new units should be built mm -hmm. once this government agrees to build some units. How we want that mixed use zoning to happen, where, where, how we want sure. to disperse throughout the city, how we want to address the public transit problems so that people can get around from places that aren't sort of ghettoized, as we used to say, or concentrated in low income housing. All those conversations are valid. As soon as the Minister of CSSD and the Premier Fury stands up and says, hey, we're going to build a bunch of units and solve this problem because we think it's a problem, they haven't done that yet. So the best they've done is say, we're going to incentivize private businesses to make money on building low-income housing at some point in the future. That's the best we've got.
Which, by the way, I think is the actual solution to allow private business access to the types of funds and grants that non-private business would get in order to get their overhead low enough that they can run a profitable business that does service a lower income. Maybe, maybe that's like one of Like anchor tenants that, yeah, sure, sure. right? Like, I, I don't disagree that, that when we think about a housing mix and what that housing portfolio should be, there's room for private business to do it. But what we do have to do is recognize that the government of Newfoundland and Labrador has an obligation to the citizens of Newfoundland and Labrador. One of those obligations is a social safety net that works. That has to include housing. Now, is it cheaper for government to do it or than a for-profit business to do it that's subsidized by the government? I don't know, geez, I can figure that one out pretty quick. But if government's unwilling to do it, which they've proven since yes. the mid-70s that they are unwilling or unable to do it properly, well then maybe incentivizing private business to do it is fine. But there needs to be a mix there. We can't turn this just over to the private sector to solve this problem because they're not incentivized properly to do it. All we're going to end up doing is shoveling good money after bad to make sure that they're taking That's care fair. of people whose government, it's, ultimately it's government's job to do it. When you put your name on a ballot, the thing you should be committing to isn't a pension, isn't stand up in the House of Assembly, isn't to show up to chicken dinners and try to get elected again, is to try to care for the people who are most vulnerable in their riding. And I haven't seen a politician in Newfoundland Labrador stand up and say that in a very long time. Moment of silence for all of the politicians who will hopefully listen to that and take heed. Mr. Meads, thank you very much for taking your time. Uh, I hope you paid attention and listened. We got some stuff going on. We will be right back after this. Welcome back to Out of the Fog. Staying on the same theme of finding ways to help people that do need some help, often through no fault of their own, I would like to introduce you to the Executive Director of Thrive, Angela Crockwell. Thanks for coming out. Thanks so much for having me. My, my pleasure, very much so. Uh, there's a few things that I want to get into, but before we do that, I'd like in your words, not necessarily what I'd find if I Googled Thrive, C-Y-N, uh, Community Youth Network, correct? Yep. Yeah. What is Thrive? T tell us what Thrive does so the audience understands the rest of what we're talking about. Sure, so uh, we're a charitable organization here in the city of St. John's. Um, and I think the simplest way to describe the programs and services that we focus on is we've worked really hard to try to address gaps in um, services within the city. So all of our programs came out of an identified need. So we offer alternative education for young people who didn't make it through the school system. We uh, operate programs specifically around trying to address uh, anti-human trafficking and anti-sexual exploitation. And we also operate um, Street Reach, which is a street-based outreach service. We also do you know drop in programs that also exist in other places throughout the city but we're probably the only street based outreach service and we're really focused on trying to support people who um, are marginalized or experience a number of vulnerabilities so again not unlike other community services work a lot around mental health substance use housing and homelessness um, trauma um, you know, violence, those kinds of things. So really trying to connect people who um, are often challenged to be connected to services or systems and try to maximize their supports. And I would think the other thing, again, not unique to Thrive, is we're really focused on harm reduction. So um, try to create as low barrier services, meet people where they are. I know that's all buzzwords, no, um, I mean, but we is, really but, try but to do that. But they mean something. They are buzzwords, yeah. but they, and they mean something. And sometimes when you're, you're speaking about the type of services that are this um, socially supportive and meeting people where they are really just means like if there's, I don't know, just as an example, if there is 
um, somebody who is super high risk because they had to flee their home and they're only young and they're trying to come across a way to sleep at night, it's a lot easier to fall asleep uh, indoors somewhere warm and you don't need the bottle if you got that to the same degree you do if you're trying to do it on the corner. So meeting people where they're at means finding a way to solve the problem they have in the moment they have it, not where it would be five years later if you, right? So, yeah. uh, you know, you said like, I know they're buzzwords or whatever, but they're buzzwords for a reason. So saying people are vulnerable or saying people are high risk or saying like tangibly speaking, what does that mean to somebody outside that community? Like to somebody who isn't trying to be inclusive with the way that they describe that. What do those things mean functionally and specifically in some cases? So I, we always talk about um, trauma, particularly early childhood trauma. So, you know, obviously there are outliers of the folks that we support, sure. but I would say the common thread um, through, regardless of the program, is most of the people we support have had experiences of uh, trauma as children and have had lots of contact with systems. So they may have grown up in, you know, you know foster care, child protection, they may have experienced uh, abuse as children, uh, poverty is can be very traumatic for people. Yeah. So there's multiple systems and challenges that they faced. And so as they, um, as they you know, grow older, you see that those kinds of traumatic experiences um, show up you know, in their everyday lives. So it can, you know, obviously mental health, Sometimes people um, use substances to be able to cope with those uh, traumatic experiences. It may make being engaged in community life, it, you know, yeah. being good tenants, all of those things can be really impacted. And so I think it's really important for people to understand that there's a number of things that happen to people and a number of probably failure systems or policy failures that led people to be yeah. where they are and in that struggle. It is not their choice. It there, is not necessarily of their making. There are very few people in, I don't, don't want to say in the world, like I know this to be a mm. fact, but the data suggests that there are very few people who uh, have an addiction to a substance that in life are otherwise happy and well. You, you don't develop addictions to substances when everything in your life is amazing. Yeah. Like it's, it's just, it, it just tends not to happen. But one of the ways that um, we, we try to assist here, I'm gonna sort of transition into a relationship that Thrive has with Rogers, something called uh, Connected for Success. And if you could sort of talk about the benefits of that and how it, it changes not, I mean, I'm sure it changes your life personally, but I'm more concerned about like the, the I, don't, I don't know, I, I, customers is the wrong word. The we patron, call them participants. Participants, okay, yeah. yeah. So if you could talk a little bit about Connected for Success and how that trickles down. Yeah, so we've been a partner with Rogers for about five years with their Connected for Success program, and it started out as being able to get access to uh, internet cable at a very reduced cost. And so they've just recently launched a mobile plan, which is really fantastic, and we're so excited to be able to offer that to the people that we support. So it's a reduced monthly fee, uh, $25 a month, people can have access to a, uh, a mobile plan, and there's also an ability to, uh, if they sign a contract again, to get a cell phone for free. And, you know, in today's world, there was a time, and particularly, you know, maybe five or ten years ago, like, you know, people would often talk about if they seen people who were really struggling on the street, and there was some judgment around if they had a cell phone. Yeah, well, um, spending the money right? on a cell phone. You got a there, cell yeah. phone. Um, I really hope that we have come to an understanding where, in today's world, a cell phone is pretty much an essential service. And we really noted that through the pandemic. Um, we were fortunate enough to get a pot of funding from the provincial government for uh, women and gender diverse people because we knew that they were going to be disproportionately 
impacted by the pandemic. And the number one thing that people really needed access to was the cell phone in minutes. Because if you want to, you know, get connected to services, if you have an emergency and you do not have a phone, um, that's a huge, or huge challenge. Or you need challenge. to get out of an unsafe place and the only way to do it is a device that isn't monitored. Absolutely, exactly. Yeah. So this opportunity now allows us to give people access to be able to get a cell phone and maintain a cell phone from month to month. So as you said, you know, when you think about people, if you are having a medical emergency, mm -hmm. you need to be able to call somebody for help. If you are a, a woman who's trying to flee violence and you need to call the domestic uh, hotline, you know, like you need technology to be able to do all of that, and then just even for access to medical care now, you know, fine services. Sure, yeah. But also, you know, for most of us in our day-to-day -day lives, it is our way to be connected as well. So if you're struggling, because that isolation is awful. Absolutely. That loneliness is so bad. So are yep. you getting particular? Is there any feedback that you're getting from the participants who've been able to take advantage of? Yeah, I mean, people, because, you know, the, the, the thing with this program is the affordability piece. So, you know, being able to make sure that they have the cell phone and they can maintain that with, because the bill from month to month is much more doable than a traditional plan. So it really allows them a sense of connectedness and a sense of safety. Uh, and again, if people are parenting, you know, not only safety yes, for yeah. themselves, but th to know that they have access to uh, cell phone and data that if something happened and they needed to make phone calls, now they can do yeah. it, which is a pretty basic thing that we all should have we, access we take to. It for, we take it for granted, and not yeah. to mention the sense of self-accomplishment of self that through some of your worst times in, in life like that you're going through, yeah. you've been able to maintain this and keep some security for yourself and for your family. So yeah. I guess it's fair to say that Connected for Success is a success so far with Thrive. Yeah. Uh, Angela, thank you so much for coming out. Um, Thanks for having me. Love the work that you do, and I would like to talk more about it. And ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back after this. Welcome back. So what I'm gleaning from these two conversations about the stuff we have going on now is, is that there are good people who want to do good things for other good people who aren't in good places. But also that the problem you think we have isn't the problem, it's probably just a symptom. And you can't fix a problem if you don't know what it is. So dig down, get mad at the people. <laughs> Stir up the pot and let's see if we can help some kind people. We'll see you next time. is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Provide feedback on this show or find out how you can get involved. Email us at comments at rogerstv.com or visit our website. Today, I help the senior find transportation to an important medical appointment. Today, I helped a new mom find virtual programming so